thank you. Um, good morning, and uh, there we are. Um, thanks for uh, showing up early. It is, I guess, even earlier for me. It's sometime overnight in, in the U.S., but um, I really appreciate being here, and thanks to everyone for the invitation and uh, the opportunity to listen and, and learn and hopefully have dialogue with, with all of you over the next uh, few days. Um, I'm, uh, as Anna mentioned, I'm uh, Ivan Ransky. I'm uh, based in New York at Retraction Watch. I also am, I also teach at NYU and work at Medscape just by way of uh, sort of what my disclosures are, but also um, how I actually earn a living. Um, Retraction Watch is a, a volunteer activity, but I do have to pay the mortgage somehow. Our bank doesn't think that um, you know, Retraction Watch really pays the mortgage, but so be it. Um, so what I'm going to do today is try and walk through the question, if not entirely answer the question, does science self-correct? And we have a rule in journalism that if you, if you have a headline that is a question, uh, the answer is almost undeniably no. Um, however, hopefully today, the, the answer will be a little bit more uh, interesting, a little less binary than just a yes or no answer, and I hope that I can shed some light on that and, and prompt some discussion. I do want to leave some time, of course, for that. So I, I, I want to start with a very, uh, very recent example. Um, some of you may be aware that there is uh, something called a uh, novel coronavirus. Some of you might have heard of this. Uh, I, I imagine all of us have heard of it. Maybe, maybe we've all heard of it, in fact, too much. Uh, but this is obviously quite an active story. Um, what the WHO is calling it is, of course, subject to change almost every day. But uh, this is obviously a big story. And I just want to point out something that happened only a few weeks ago. This all happened in, in the last month. Um, and, you know, in terms of correcting science and self-correction, what actually happens and, and where is it happening and how quickly is it happening? So this is a, uh, a preprint that appeared. You're all, I'm sure, familiar with preprint servers one way or another. Some of you may have, in fact, uh, posted your own manuscripts there. This is BioArchive, obviously, Biological Sciences uh, preprint server. And there are a couple of interesting things I just want to note. This was a, a preprint that was posted at the end of January. It was posted on a, a Friday. And uh, it basically, and I'm, you know, please do read it, of course. It's still, it's still there, even though it's uh, withdrawn. Uh, but, you know, sort of generally speaking, sort of superficially speaking, if you will, uh, it said that uh, it had used the word uncanny. And those of you who, you know, sort of think about the word uncanny in, a, in the title of a paper, a scientific paper, that's, you know, quite sort of what we would say is loaded language. It's sort of very suggestive, uh, uncanny. And this paper basically says that wow, you know, they found some sequence homology, protein, uh, protein homology, protein sequence homology between the new novel coronavirus and HIV. And they said, and they went much, much further than that. They said, well, because of certain other things that we know, they came up with this, what I think a lot of people would agree was a conspiracy theory that clearly the coronavirus had been engineered in a lab and it was being, and it had somehow, you know, gotten out of the lab and was now going to infect the world, and it was actually a bioterror weapon. There's all kinds of things were happening. That happened on a Friday, and I just want to very quickly say that by Sunday, this paper had been withdrawn from BioArchive, and there had been lots of, I think, close to 100 comments on it saying, wait, what is this? Why is this happening? Very active Twitter discussions, all sorts of things. So, you know, very problematic paper, which I don't even think the authors would disagree with at this point, but in fact, within 48 hours, it was withdrawn, you know, the sort of preprint version of retracted. Of retracted. Um, here's another story, though, that was about a different, this was a letter to the editor, so it did not really, it was not subjected, to be fair, to sort of rigorous peer review, but it was at least looked at, and it was in a, a you know, a, a publication that some of you may have heard of. It's called the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and this was a science piece by Kai Kupferschmidt. It's actually here based, based here in Germany for science. Uh, you know, again, pointing out that this paper, this, this letter was extremely flawed. I mean, there were just some basic errors in it. And I want to show you, and this, by the way, I checked even this morning just to make sure that I was up to date. This is the letter to the editor. And I would be happy to show you. I can't fit it on the screen, but you can check it out yourselves, of course. There's the, yeah, I did include the DOI. You can check it. There is no mention of the fact that this, this letter has been severely questioned. And, and by legitimate sort of, well, I hate to be, I, play, I hate to play the, the eminence game, but people who know what they're talking about, people who have the expertise. Um, no, no mention of it at all. And so one of the arguments you hear very often is that the scientific literature corrects itself. It does what is needed to be done so that people can stay up to date as well as possible. 
um, and that preprint servers are very dangerous because they allow anyone to post anything. There's a sort of what's called a quote unquote sanity check. You know, could this be possible if it were true kind of thing? Uh, is it, you know, obviously defamatory, that sort of thing, uh, which goes into preprint screening, and a lot of people don't even want that much screening. But in fact, after the fact, it is much easier, at least in this case, to have corrected and in fact withdrawn a preprint. So does this, the, the does the, the answer, the quick answer, if you will, to does science self-correct is, as is almost always the case with any question like that, it depends. Um, but I also think that it's not as quickly as we would like, or frankly, not as quickly as scientists would like us to think that it does. But I will get there. So let me back up after that sort of anecdote and tell you a little bit about why. And some of you may be familiar with this story, so I apologize, I apologize but I'll do it quickly. Why uh, Adam Marcus, who's my co-founder, and I uh, started Retraction Watch. It's actually been, we, we put up our, we posted our 5,000th post uh, this past week, which kind of uh, amazed me and Adam, um, not in a good way, sort of as a, wow, that I think uh, as a half-trained psychiatrist, I have to wonder whether that's actually somehow in the DSM for obsession, but um, I'll, I'll worry about that later in my own time. Um, but we launched in August of 2010, and, and we had two basic reasons. And for those of you, you probably can't even see it, uh, and even if you could, outside of the U.S., it doesn't mean all that much. But this is a picture of um, Harry Truman, President Harry Truman in the 1950s, holding up a newspaper in Chicago saying, Dewey defeats Truman. Um, again, I wouldn't expect all of you to you know, remember all of our U.S. presidents. We, we're trying to forget <laughs> at least one of them right now, but um, I wouldn't expect those of you outside the U.S. to remember all of our U.S. presidents, um, but I can assure you there was no President Dewey. What had happened was all of the, poll, all of the newspapers that had to be, go to print before all the polls were closed. We have a modern equivalent of that again, of course, but um, they had to actually retract all of these newspapers. And so it's a sort of classic you know, story that, again, probably has no resonance outside the U.S., but that's our initial photo. And there were two reasons why we launched Attraction Watch. Uh, the first was Adam had been reporting on a case, uh, which I won't go into details of, but involving someone named Scott Rubin, who uh, was an anesthesiologist or pain researcher, and he was studying Celebrex, Celecoxib, which is one of the sort of quote-unquote new, new generation uh, painkillers. It was supposed to be much safer than the older generation painkillers. Long story short, it almost certainly isn't. But Rubin ended up going to federal prison in the U.S. for scientific fraud or for charges related to scientific fraud because it turned out he had made up all of the patients in all of his clinical trials. Now, you know, you might say that's subtle. That's not, you know, well, no one was hurt because no one had to, you didn't have to worry about IRB approval, for example. It's a very easy way to do clinical trials, but of course it's fakery. It's, it's complete fraud. So he went to prison. Adam had broken that story because he used to edit Anesthesiology News, a trade publication. So I thought, well, here are these great stories hiding in plain sight. And as journalists, that's, it's like catnip. It's, it's, it's like, you know, it really is an obsession. You, you find new stories no one else has, and you don't have to dive into someone's dumpster or you know, have uncomfortable conversations with people. They're just sitting there. But the, the flip side of that is that all of these retraction notices that we were reading were often, they were somewhere between opaque and misleading. They didn't include the kind of information that we thought that scientists would want to have to understand why a paper was retracted. Uh, and this has been well documented by others as well. So, you know, we thought, okay, there's a journalism reason to do this. There's also a sort of scientific integrity transparency reason to do this. Let's start a blog. We thought it would be read by a few people and we would po put up a few posts a month. I just told you that we just posted our 5,000th post and we can't even keep up with retractions, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so we post uh, every day. For a while we were posting more than once a day uh, about various retractions and other related stories. Um, but several years ago, actually, I guess going on six years ago now, um, we realized that there was no good source of all retractions. No, there was no good database of all retractions. So with some very generous funding, uh, for which we're very grateful, we created a database, which you can go to and, and search yourselves, retractiondatabase.org. We now, as of uh, this week, have 21,000 retractions. 
in retractiondatabase.org. Uh, that's almost twice as many as you'll find in any other sort of similar database like Web of Science or I mean, PubMed has only about a third of those. Uh, and those are both selective for different reasons. We have ones you wouldn't expect them to have. But, and yet, as you can tell, uh, we're, we're very committed to the data and the, 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 the sort of comprehensiveness and cleanliness and taxonomy of the data. Uh, we are journalists though, we're not computer programmers or UX designers, so if that looks like it's from 1998, well, it looks like it's from 1998, we'd be happy to work with anyone who wanted to help us with it. We also are more than happy to, uh, subject to a pretty minimal data use agreement, uh, provide these data to anyone who wants to research a subject. Just two papers just this week came out using our database, and we're always very excited about that and seeing what others can find uh, based on the 21,000 and growing retraction. So let me give you a little bit of a sense of what we found uh, in that. And, and again, getting to this question of the sign self-correct. 21,000 retractions, by the way, sounds like a lot. It's a big number. It's certainly a lot of work to do that database. On the other hand, over that time, and these go back, we have one from actually 1756, um, which is, you know, in the US, that's you know, ancient history. I know here it's a little bit, a little bit younger than that, but it's still quite a ways back. Um, and most of them, of course, have happened since 2000. Uh, but it's a lot of work, but in that time, imagine how many tens of millions of papers have been published, and I want to always put that in perspective. And to that end, so we officially launched the database about a year and a half ago in Science Magazine uh, with a big uh, feature, six pages. This was not the peer-reviewed side. I just want to be clear, this was the journalism side, although we like to think that it was quite rigorous. Uh, we worked very closely with them, and they really did the analysis. We worked with them to, you know, just offer suggestions and, and feedback. Um, but this is the rate of retractions uh, over time. And so if you look, it's roughly, you know, at this point, and I would ignore, by the way, everything after 2016, these, this is the year the paper was published, not the year the paper was retracted, and there is a lag of about three years, which kind of gets also to my question of does science self-correct? Um, so I would ignore that. It's kind of looking, looking at, you know, future stock price. It, I don't think there's much validity to it. They wanted to put that in there and, and what have you. Um, but basically, if you exclude a large group of retractions that are for conference abstracts, uh, which science decided to do. I think other analyses don't do that, but that's obviously just a choice you make for various reasons. Um, you know, the rate of retraction is more or less plateaued at about four per 10,000 papers published. Again, that's quite rare. I mean, it's 0.04%. Uh, it's not 1%, it's not 2%, it's not even 0.1%. Uh, it's quite a rare event. I'm gonna get to what the number maybe should be without a specific answer to that question. Um, but, you know, the question we always get is why, has, why has, have it, retractions increased? Uh, and I think it's very clear that a large part, if not the, the majority of uh, the reason retractions have increased is because everyone's actually looking. And I'm going to get to some of the people who are doing that looking. Uh, there's us sort of cataloging, but we don't, we're not actually examining four problems, even though sometimes people think that's what we do, and that's fine. Um, but lots more people looking. But I also would, would posit to you that there is some evidence that misconduct itself is on the rise, or at least the, the kinds of misconduct are growing and none of them is shrinking. And so therefore, again, I'm gonna suggest this as a, an answer to my question, uh, or at least a sort of important context for the answer for answering my question. Leave it to you to decide and, and maybe even study it yourselves. So let me sort of run, I'm not gonna sort of go through each one of these, but I'll just flash them on the screen and, and show you sort of, these are common reasons for attraction. Um, some are, I mean, in the, when I say common, some are far more common uh, than others. Um, th there's duplication, in other words, uh, you know, use, doing the same thing, more, trying to publish the same thing more than once. There's plagiarism, I hope you know, you all are familiar with that concept, um, and don't do it. Uh, image manipulation, a big reason for what we see now because it's easy to spot, or it's easier to spot, and I'm gonna get to some of the people who are doing that. There's fake data, I mentioned, um, I mentioned Scott Rubin, he faked data. Um, fake peer reviews, some of you may be familiar with this phenomenon where uh, and it's responsible for about 750 retractions by now in our database. Uh, this is when you are able to, in a couple of different ways, but usually involving some sort of fake email address, uh, you're actually able to peer review your own paper. And I know now you're thinking, wow, that's great. I'm really glad I came to this conference because now I can ask this guy how to peer review my own paper. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, we accept actually don't accept cash, we only accept cash for that conversation. Um, but I would also say don't do that because you'll get caught. There are, we know about it now, we wrote it in Nature about it five and a half years ago. Uh, journals have done things to try and at least backstop, you know, stop most of it. 
Um, and, and there are other issues here that I, I again, won't go into. Um, you know, authorship, I'm sure all of you have had at least one experience, those of you who publish anything, where people either want to be on papers that they maybe shouldn't be or uh, don't want to be, you know, or they are on papers that they shouldn't be. There's all sorts of things happening. There are people who put uh, their dogs on papers. Um, I don't think those should be retracted. I think it's hilarious. Uh, but, you know, there's a hamster. There's a very famous hamster physicist you may have heard of. Um, but anyway, uh, those are more fun than anything else. They're more for tonight's reception than for sort of a serious conversation, but they're fun. Um, and, and if you catch me there, ask me the one that I wouldn't say in public like this that's uh, sort of a, a very rude name in, in Italian. Those of you who speak Italian, uh, I can tell you about that one. Um, this is another uh, graphic from the, uh, from the science analysis. And Again, um, I'm, I'm colorblind to begin with, so I wouldn't even try and explain, you know, sort of describe what I'm seeing here. It's beautiful, but I don't know what colors any of it is. Any of it is. Um, but what this, if I may give you the punchline, the sort of oversimplified uh, answer to this, about 60% of the time, retractions are due to something that we would consider misconduct, right? So the sort of big old standard definitions of misconduct like falsification, fabrication, plagiarism, but also fake peer review, we throw that, that in there, we think that's, that, that isn't in any federal definition, but it's certainly fakery, it's certainly misconduct. Um, and this is, you know, again, if you ignore everything after 2015, everything grows, but everything sort of grows the same amount, sort of inflation on each, each reason. But only about 20% are due to what is clearly honest error. And, you know, some people say, I, was, I gave a, I used this slide in a talk last weekend at AAAS in Seattle, and someone said, well, you know, I, I think it's, it's a, you should sort of not talk about fraud, you should talk about those 20%. And I said, well, I am talking about those 20%. And she said, well, that, I think that number should be higher. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's do more retraction. I'm going to get to that in a second. But the idea that we should somehow, you know, ignore the 60% of misconduct struck me as a little bit well, I just, I'll say it politely, I don't think it's all that evidence-based, but um, it, it's just, it's a conversation we end up having a lot about what we should talk about. Um, but if I can maybe focus a bit more on the question here uh, and, and, and use all those data to kind of maybe inform this discussion a little bit. Um, one of the things that we see, so even when retractions do happen, uh, they take an awfully long time. So I said that the, the average, I may not have said this, but the average retraction time from publication to retraction is about three years. Now that's a somewhat bimodal distribution. We have ones from, you may have seen a uh, post we did last week about Hans Eysenck and those papers are starting to be retracted. Um, some of them are 30 years old. Um, we have an 80 year old retraction. Actually it was another story for tonight, I won't tell you now, but a very funny one that involved German medical students. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk, no, excuse me, no, they were not German medical students, they were Dutch medical students. I, Lex, you're right here, He's, he, he would have, you know, laser eyes would have gotten me for that. They were Dutch medical students, a hilarious story, which I can, again, tell you over drinks later. But the, but the, the thing is, why did these take so long? And, and by the way, these are all headlines from Retraction Watch, and I want to tell you what these are about, these stories. This is not sort of, okay, well, you know, somebody found a problem, and maybe it was a problem, maybe it wasn't a problem, and why does it take so long to retract that paper? These are all cases where we filed public records requests for... And, and sorry to those of you for whom this makes you vulnerable, but tough, that's what I do as a journalist. If you're at a public institution, particularly in the US, we will file a, if we have time, which we don't always, but when we find time, we will file a public records request for the correspondence between the university and the journal once an investigation is complete. So I want to stress, this is on official letterhead. It's from a lawyer or a provost or someone, vice president of research. It still takes three years in these, it has still took three years, two years in these cases, between that letter, which you would think would be enough information to act on, and which you would think would, even if you're a journal who's worried about lawyers, which I know a lot of them are, you would think that would be enough information and, and sort of, okay, we at least have this to back us up and we know there's something wrong with it, still takes two or three years, okay? Um, here's a, just a study that came out. Um, you may be familiar with the Sato case out of Japan. Um, the, the late uh, Professor Sat, Yoshihiro Sato. Uh, again, I won't read this all to you in the interest of time, and, and I will. I, I think this is being recorded, but I'm, I'll make my slides available on uh, on SlideShare and send them around with the hashtag and all that. Anyway, um, essentially, again, the punchline here is a group of researchers has been looking through a uh, one particular researcher's work, uh, found serious problems that they've documented, and they're really quite clear. I mean, these are not subtle, and they found that. You know, the, again, the punchline is, general responses to concerns about duplicate publication, et cetera, 
or slow, opaque, and inconsistent. But again, the numbers are here. You can look it up for yourself. But this is a, these are typical stories. This is what we see. And you know, frankly, these are the ones where people actually took the time to document it. A lot of the time, they just send us emails. And we know they're right, but we're not going to sort of suddenly go out with that. So again, are we catching them all? If, if you're looking at, you know, that was, excuse me, 16, that's 44%. That's almost half, actually. In this paper, which some of you may be familiar with, this was by David Allison and colleagues. He was then at University of Alabama, Birmingham. They looked at two dozen papers, and then they stopped because they just got sick of it. But they found serious statistical issues in all of these papers. Only eight of the journals even wrote back to them. So only a third of the journals even bothered to acknowledge in some significant way that maybe they'd gotten their letter. Okay, so what is going on at the other two-thirds of the journals? Um, I hope that a lot of you are, and if you're not, please, uh, I would urge you, if you're interested in this field, which you obviously are because you're here, to, be f to, to familiarize yourself with the work of uh, Elizabeth Bick. Um, Elizabeth is the first author here. Uh, she's a microbiologist by training, PhD uh, in microbiology, uh, has had a number of important roles, but now her role is as a, really as a scientific sleuth. You'll see a picture of her in several slides. Um, but the two punchlines from this, again, the DOI's there, I hope it is, but if it isn't, I have to send the reference. Um, you know, she found that about 2% of papers, so remember, I was talking about retractions being 0.4%. 2% is, I, I was not, all, I, I'm okay at math, okay enough for a medic, not all that good at it, but I'm quite sure that 2% is much higher than 0.4%. Okay, uh, excuse me, you know, uh, yeah, 0.04%. Oh, uh, oh um, she found that 2% of papers had, you know, fairly obvious signs of image manipulation, and nothing has been done to the vast majority of these papers. But even more importantly, to my sort of point earlier, the, this seemed to be on the rise over the, over the decade she looked at. So there's something maybe going on. Everyone has Photoshop on their, on their uh, computers now. Nobody used to. So you can both do the fraud and catch the fraud. Um, this is a little bit of um, what we refer to in the U.S. as sort of a popcorn uh, slide. Uh, people are sort of interested in this, and I'll, I'll do this quickly, but um, this is, we have a leaderboard on Retraction Watch. It goes down to about, in order to get onto the leaderboard, in case any of you are really, you know, interested in uh, sort of our sports metaphor and being in the top 30, uh, you have to have 22 retractions. So I, I can talk to you later about how to get on to our leaderboard if you're interested, but these are the people in the world with the most retractions. Um, the number one is, uh, uh, obviously here, he has 183 retractions. It's, it's impressive. I mean, not in a very good way, but it's impressive. But does anyone, does anyone see there are sort of two demographic characteristics, again, with an incredibly small sample size, uh, of this top 10? Anyone want to shout out what they see? I hear Japanese. I think I heard something about women over there, or the lack of women, right? So yes, uh, Japan is overrepresented here, although part of that is an art artifact. Two of these are co-authors, so that's just how, how, it roll, how you roll. Um, but there are also no women on the list. They're actually, you go all the way to the bottom of the list, there's only one woman on the list, and not, uh, she's sort of toward the bottom of it. So just, again, in the interest of uh, equality and um, egalitarianism, I'd be happy to work with any of you who, well, no. Uh, you know, why, why this is true, we have no idea. And again, it's a small sample size. These are extremes. I want to be careful about that. But there is something going on. And by the way, even if you account for, and someone did this analysis, if you account for the overrepresentation of men uh, in positions where they're writing papers and in authorship and all the rest of it, it's still like nine to one. So it's, I don't know what's happening, but we can speculate. Maybe over drinks again. Um, one, again, why does this matter? You know, does the scientific record self-correct? And even when it does, do future authors, if you will, who are looking at those papers, do they care or do they pay attention? Um, and the answer, hopefully, here will be no. Now, I'm going to, again, in the interest of time, welcome to discuss this later or, or what have you and look at, these, look at this paper. But, and Alison O'Brightis is our... Uh, researcher at Traction Watch, so she's on this paper. Essentially, f only 4% of papers that cited retracted papers mentioned that the papers were cited. Now, any of you who are attorneys or know attorneys or have been in court, uh, that's probably all of us together in, in those three groups, um, you know, if you tried to cite a case that had been overturned in court, you'd lose your case. And if the judge knew that you had, you know, cited a case knowingly, right, uh, bad things would happen to you. Really, I mean, Bad things would happen to you. Not so much in science. So, you know, it's okay. Just keep citing those retracted papers. Now, one of the reasons why, okay, is that uh, journals are not very good at actually letting people know. Some are better than others, uh, but this was just one paper. Librarians like to study this subject for obvious reasons. 40% of the time, 
the, uh, the journal, you couldn't tell that the paper had been retracted. Okay? Um, that, that's, again, a problem. So if you want to solve that problem for yourself and it's free, uh, you can, some of you may already use Zotero, but, and it's not an ad for Zotero, it's free anyway, and they, but um, we have a partnership with Zotero. They actually, we send them a download of our database every night, and they run your, your library, personal library, against it, and you get a little ping that looks like that. Um, sorry to those of you who may have been involved in that paper, but I think we're, we're all sort of hopefully past that one by now, but that's just a sort of typical example. You'll actually get an alert. You don't have to do anything. It's free. Um, and uh, we love it because it's, it's just a way to use the database. So very quickly to, to sort of wrap up here in the last several slides. Um, one of the things that is obviously happening is that all of these things are being caught in post-publication peer review, not in peer review. Um, and, and again, I, I hope we can have a discussion, uh, if not right now, then at some point. And there are lots of discussions happening about peer review, but why are these things happening afterward? A lot of you may be familiar with PubPeer, full disclosure, I'm on their, again, it's a volunteer position, but on their board of directors, it's a uh, nonprofit based in the U.S. But um, PubPeer is a place where you can leave comments on any paper that has a DOI or a PubMed ID. Uh, and this is leading, this is just one example. but. Um, I mentioned Elizabeth Bick. She posts, every, I, I, don't, I want to say everything because I don't know what she's up to day to day, but I do know that she posts a, a heck of a lot on Pub Peer and she uses her name. Not, she's not even anonymous on there. Uh, Nick Brown and James Heathers. This is, those of you who know the, the movie Goodfellas, uh, that's an homage to Goodfellas. And um, this is being recorded, so I have to be careful. But uh, even though Nick, Nick doesn't like to admit he looks like that, he does. And James cops to actually looking like that. But that's kind of, if you know the Goodfellas, the movie, that's kind of, it's a scene from a diner and it's kind of that, they call themselves, or James calls them uh, data thugs. And the idea is, that's a really nice data set. It would be a shame if anything happened to it. Kind of data thugs. Um, anyway, and I think this is just about it. I have one more, uh, one more thing to just talk about. Um, some of you know this Duke case that happened recently, a large settlement, something called the False Claims Act, which is unique to the US, but you know, who knows, may take off in other places. Um, this is the cost of not doing anything. And if, if, you, if you want to just bean count, which lots of universities, with due respect to universities, seem to want to do, I don't know. I think there are other things you can do with $112.5 million uh, other than pay it back to the U.S. government. Um, and by the way, that guy is now worth $34 million of those dollars because that's the way the law works in the U.S. So just saying. Um, so where does the buck stop, you know, and, uh, you know, you'd probably sort of say, well, with probably one of these, or maybe you've got a couple other ideas. Uh, here's where I think the book actually stops. And we, we love lawyers, but um, you know, lawyers are not necessarily good for scientific transparency. They tend to muck things up a lot. And we want to recognize that and understand that when it comes to journals so that we're not completely naive about that. Um, speaking of some, let me get very quickly to some good news. Um, again, it probably doesn't look like good news depending your, on your perspective, but this is retractions over the past several years, over the past decade from PLOS One, which one of our whistleblowers called a major retraction engine. Um, now, as you know, PLOS One publishes a lot of papers, so as a percentage of their papers is extremely small. However, and that's just a projection for this year, but they topped 100 retractions last year, which wasn't a record, but that's not for other journals. Um, and one of the ways that that's happening, it's, it's due to people like Elizabeth Bick, it's due to people like the anonymous or pseudonymous Claire Francis, who does a lot of similar work. This is a piece that Adam and I wrote for, um, for uh, STAT a couple of years ago, but this is about the fact that places like PLOS, places like uh, JBC, uh, FEBS, Letters, other journals are hiring research integrity managers. We've actually created jobs uh, indirectly through our work at Retraction Watch, not for us, but for other people. That's okay. Um, and so this is actually a good development. They're screening both pre and post publication. Um, and then finally, again, again another sign of change. Um, we, we have a sort of joke in journalism that if something happens three times, it's a trend, right? Because we're very statistically, you know, aware in, in journalism. So we think three times must be a trend. Or at the New York Times, this is a bit of an inside joke, but at the New York Times, if it happens to your editor, then it's a trend, right? Um, but we do think that there may be a little bit of a trend here happening. Um, this is Kate Laskowski who posted a, a tweet. And this was one of three people just in recent memory. One of them was a Nobel Prize winner who tweeted, I'm retracting a paper. In fact, Francis Arnold, the Nobel Prize winner, tweeted that before it was even retracted, just transparency and the rest of it. And she said, I was too busy flying around the world and I wasn't paying attention after I won my Nobel. Very honest. These people are very, very honest. Um, I don't know, can you be very honest? They're honest. Um, anyway, so there is some change happening. Does science self-correct? 
The quick answer is yes on a geological scale or as you know Max Planck said of course science advances one funeral at a time um, but there are some signs of change. We do like to sort of point those out so that it doesn't seem all doom and gloom all the time but there's a lot of work to be done um, and there I am with all those things. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'd say I'll allow one question because we're best pressed for time. Um, just a quick fun fact for people who are using Sotero and uh, are doing research on retractions. This is very disruptive. Uh, my database is full of retractions because I like to study them and Sotero keeps interrupting me. But that's just I, a I would say sorry, but <laughs> not no, no, really. That's okay. That's okay. It's just, uh, just an outlier. Um, I'm wondering about your journalistic process because one of the things that to me seems to be happening on and off again on, on, on your blog is you're very successful in that you get a lot of recognition for this, you seem to have a lot of hits, people are looking at what you're, what you're posting um, and I'm not sure what you do if the people you are incriminating because this is something you do sometimes, right? You raise issues for people where we don't really know uh, at the end of the day whether there was something problematic or not. Give you an example. You had a philosopher on your, on your blog uh, last year um, who's very famous, who was posting under a pseudonym for the whole of her career. The whole community knew about it. It had a, an important reason for it. Um, it is an established praxis in humanistic uh, writing that you use pseudonyms and you implied that she was 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 plagiarizing or something similar So the question I was asking myself if she wanted to have that post retracted on your website What would she have to do? Um, not the least because you're still doing mock shots on your website Which is something I would associate with sort of a tabloid type of journalism so what is, what is the process for people who feel wrongfully accused and who want their, their post on your website uh, to be retracted? So I would, uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to answer and then we can maybe have a conversation later. Um, I would challenge the premise that we are implicating people where we're not just reporting facts as they are. We always, and I stress always, give people the opportunity to respond. Most people choose not to. That is their choice. The idea, however, that we should withhold from publishing facts because someone doesn't like them. Um, we have a government in the U.S. that has that same approach, and I would hope that academia is a little bit in a little bit better place than that. The idea, again, we, we give people time to respond and ask them, you know, what, did, what happened here? Tell us your side of the story. We often learn lots of things that the journal didn't know or that the journal may have known but didn't you know, put out in the public. Um, that's what we do. And so if someone wanted to retract a post, we've retracted one post in 10 years. I won't get into details, but happy to, uh, just to give you a sense. We always are responding to people. People are bringing us questions, threatening to sue us. Sometimes that hasn't happened. But um, so I, th there's just an open dialogue, there's an open process. And, you know, the fact that a fact is sort of inconvenient uh, to, to sort of paraphrase Al Gore is, is just not a reason we're not going to publish it. Um, you know, mugshots, I, I, these are, we're almost always taking those from university websites. If you have an issue with the picture that you yourself or that the university is putting on your university website, send us a different one, but that's, that's not a mugshot in that sense. Okay, then thank you again. Thank you.